Scott Heller, uh, who graduated in March 1999, um, having worked in the security group uh, on a thesis with uh, Susan Bryant Jenner, who's now in Japan. And um, Scott was the Navy League Award winner when he graduated. And yes, I've been here. Um, so he was a really super student and did a, a really fine uh, job on his thesis. And um, today he's going to, he's at Baylor Charleston, and he's going to be talking to us about the Coalition Data Server, uh, which is a, a project uh, that may help out the Navy in dealing with some of their near-term MLS problems. Thank you. This is the first time I've ever stood on this side of <laughs> the chairs in here. It looks an awful hot up there. The Coalition Data Server was a, an effort by 161 and NRL to uh, provide an 80% solution to how do we share data files with our coalition allies, in particular at NATO. It is where we're targeting. The program manager is Bassett Syed from PMW 161 at Sparrow Headquarters. The research and development is led by Ether Chapman at the Navy Research Labs. And I'm doing the certification work and installation coordination. This is what we did first. This was a pilot architecture that was installed aboard the USS Mount Whitney during Fleet Battle Experiment Hotel. As you can see, the trusted operating system in the center was uh, based on the HPROX operating system, which was discontinued about two years ago. And we were continuing to use the legacy operating system since the development work was done there and we could feel it pretty quickly to satisfy some of this or mitigate some of the security risks associated with the HPROX operating system. We had to add two pack controlling routers, one on either side of the box. And uh, their sole job was to limit all communication just over the SSL or port 443, back and forth. And I'll get into a little bit of what, how the communication works in the, in the next several slides. The purpose was to use existing infrastructure, the uh, secret US network aboard the Mount Whitney, and the secret NATO network aboard the Mount Whitney. So same sensitivity level, but different compartments. They are not comparable in a mathematical sense. And, NATO doesn't dominate the U.S., U.S. does not dominate NATO. So they really are not allowed to communicate freely back and forth. So we needed some kind of trusted architecture in the middle to allow controlled communication or authorized file sharing. The data flow for CADS is to take that, those two existing infrastructures and then add the multi-level web server. Okay with the packet forwarding routers. On the trusted operating system, we've moved to trusted Solaris. You no longer need to have the packet forwarding routers. That functionality is built into the operating system. So those two boxes sort of collapse into the middle. We then populate each of the compartments. The US compartment in the top left in the coalition compartment, which was the NATO compartment aboard the Mount Whitney, with the data and an HTTPS server, the KO. Web server called Stronghold. It's built on Apache which is a freeware web server. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. But Apache was built to run in a, within a trusted, a stronghold was built to run within a trusted operating system. We have instantiation of the web server at each sensitivity level. So even the releasable coalition compartment, we have instantiation. The reason for that is, is if you have a, an attack on the web server itself and you somehow manage to compromise the web server, you're still depending on the mandatory access controls of the trusted operating system to limit the threat or limit that attack and prevent data leakage. Communication is only via SSL or port 443. And each user on one of the NT workstations within the respective compartment to log in needs to present a PKI certificate. So whether you're going to read, post, or downgrade information, you need to have a DUD PKI certificate and present that. The route is established for the demo pilot version of board up in the LDAP server, LDAP directory, at system high on the trusted box. And the authentication was done just to the local CODS box. If you're going to read, you present the certificate, and then you can look at data from either the releasable coalition compartment or the compartment that is comparable with the network you are on. So if you're on a US secret network, you can read information out of in the US compartment. If you're on a NATO side, you can read information from the, the coalition of the NATO compartment. 
and the releasable compartment. So both sides can see simultaneously data in the releasable compartment. There is no data replication. You avoid all the replication issues. Do I have the most current version of the file, et cetera? This is kind of a terminology question that I, um, I'm a little bit confused with. You know, you say PKI certificate there. Well, you know, I can get your public key certificate, right? I can go to some directory service and get it. So it's not really the public key. Well, when you use the term certificate, you mean public key certificate. What you need to present to that client system there is something that has your private key. Right. So it just seems like the slide is a little bit was misleading when you call that presenting a certificate. Because what you, you you use a smart card that has a private key on it, and you encrypt something, and you send it, and that authenticates you. Isn't that right? Right. And that, that, that's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're using this the secret key. Jordan Fleet Bottom Square, my hotel, we had that secret key residing on a floppy. And for that reason, we used the Netscape browser, since IE required to be in the, in the registry. You couldn't just load the certificate in a floppy and use it with IE. So we used Netscape to push the floppy in when we were going to do it. They read it from the floppy. Now for the trusted Solaris version, we've moved to a smart card implementation. You do the same thing. Your private key is on the smart card. You push the smart card in, enter your PIN, password, passphrase, and then off the, to allow that card to be used and present your credentials. If you're going to post information, and the reason there's different roles are the different sets, privilege sets that are allowed. And it, there's one other, which would be the system administrator for the web administrator, which is only accessible from the local box, not from the UT clients. But if you're going to post, you would just be writing information to the respective com the compartment that is at the same level as your system high network. At aboard the uh, Mount Whitney, the second fleet, Tom Strike fifth fleet, the Atlantic. They decided that their data generators, who were the head of, that, the head of their data generation boot chain, if you want to call it that, or the chain of command, who was a Navy commander who was deciding to release the, the air tasking order or a TLAM striking message, the different types of operational traffic that needed to be shared with coalition partners. So their data generators, they were also the data releasers. So in, in order, they made the decision, they didn't want to have some, say, first class petty officer who is managing the web console being the ultimate releaser. So they didn't want to have a two-stage process where they would upload posts and then move the files down into a downgrade. They said, well, they, that would just become a rubber stamp. It doesn't make any sense to us. The data release, data generators are also the ones who are going to be granted the permission to release the data. So we had five Navy commanders who were authorized to do the releasing or move information from the respective system high compartments down to the releasable compartment. Okay. This can be done in one step. You can take a file directly from the NT workstation via web interface if you have downgrade permissions, and instead of posting it and then moving it down, you can move it directly to the releasable publishing compartment. Every upload, when it is being done, the server conducts an antivirus sweep looking for known malicious code. And it also does a dirty word search for keywords that would be within a document that are known not to be releasable. So usually if you're doing a classified document, you have proper paragraph markings, and it may say US only. Well, obviously, we would know and we look for the obvious mistakes in doing a dirty word search. Is that the function of filtering? No, there's a define, which is an antivirus tool for, for the Unix world is being used to do both the dirty word search and antivirus search. The reason it can do both is when if you're doing antivirus search, you're actually looking for a binary string but in most times for some kind of signature of that virus. While well, our dirty word is also a binary string. We just add that definition to the virus strings and allow it to search for it. Okay. And what does it look like? Right. Here it is. This is uh, if you're on a secret US side, this is what this is one instantiation of what you would see over on a demo data folder, all the way over here. <laughs> Make a walk forward. You see it, it's open. You can click anywhere in that hierarchy. It's an arbitrary hierarchy. You can add folders later on. It can grow. Or we can pre-configure it when we go and install it. We ask what their general con ops is going to be. We write their con ops. And then when you look into a folder, you see which directory you're at. And then you see a list of the files in that folder. Here they happen to be the four different graphic images. They could be 
Word files, PowerPoint slides, images, HTML files. If you click on an HTML file and your client is you're using a web client, you could render it. It could be rendered as a web page that would have the website information. This is for the most basic instantiation of the Coalition Data Server, where you just want to share individual data files. There are CGI scripts that will render the directory in real time. So every time you click on it, you get an accurate representation of what files are actually in that directory. But if you have a website that you want to have links at different sensitivity levels, you could integrate that and add those HTML files within the Coalition Data Server also. When you look for dirty words, maybe you support like different file formats, like US only in PowerPoint might look like one bit string, but in I mean, Word, it might actually look like a different string of bits. I mean, just because the way they do formatting. So I mean, is that true or? Most of the time, even though those, those documents have different formats, when it comes down to a text string, the text is still there. So it's going to be ASCII in there? It's, it's usually just ASCII in there. The d dirty word list was, is also, it's something given to us by NSA that they, they, have, devel they have developed in-house in conjunction with previous efforts done in Trade 72 to get for secure mail guards and other things that can be used. And we tried not to reinvent the wheel. It is recognized, though, that dirty word search is just to look for mistakes. Yeah, if, if I'm a user and I want to go through and do a find and replace all of 30 words that I know of in order to purposefully leak in information and I'm an insider, there is nothing in this system that is going to prevent that from an insider from purposely going and trying to move files out. And, but what's happening right now is the, the users are taking that file that they want to share they're putting it on a floppy or a jazz disk or a zip disk or something along those lines, walking over to the other network, putting it over here without any checking of that file, and none being done. No, no auditing being done. So we don't know who actually moved that file. Every file that is either read, posted, or downgraded on here is an audit log entry is created and it associates the, that PKI credentials, so the, X, X, X.509 credentials that were presented with that file. So all of a sudden you see 50 files being released because some Trojan was able to compromise somebody's certificate. At least you know one step up, you know which, file, which um, credentials were compromised and you can disable that, put that in your revocation list. Okay, so we've added auditing, we've added virus checking, we've added a dirty word search to a process that is currently sneaker net with none of those controls in place. And configuration control. And, some, and configuration management. We have now tried to standardize the process of moving data files back and forth. And I've seen other solutions out there that are uh, using existing web database technology where they automatically accept the label in the database put in by a user, not a trusted operating system. There's no way to guarantee those labels are mutable. They take a snapshot of the database and they go over and they replicate 100 megs at a time. And that's not a good solution either. So we've, we've tried to tighten the security up. It's not a 100% solution, but we think we've got about 80% of the, the issues addressed or mitigated with this. Scott, maybe this is the right place, time to do it in your, in your talk, but perhaps at some point you could give us, you're aware of a lot of the snake oil stuff that's out there, right? Yeah, I, I've, I've seen some others, and we, we can go into that a little bit. I, I don't, there's also a lot of politics associated with solutions. When you get out to the fleet, you will see that a vendor comes up with a solution, and they have a great sales team. They will come and present this to some three-star, or somebody who knows that there's an operational need. He has an extremely important operational need that he has to solve. He doesn't know how he's going to get from A to B. Some vendor comes in, and he says, here, I've got the answer. All you've got to do is buy this from me, install it, and we're good to go. And they haven't worried yet about the security implications of what they're doing. Or if they have, they've addressed it in a superficial manner and really haven't done solid engineering. So I, 
I've seen any number of different solutions come up that sort of meet that criteria. And it's superficially, it looks good. You start pulling the string, and it's all of a sudden it's a nightmare. And there's a lot of very simple vulnerabilities that, I mean, if, I, if I'm picking it out in a couple minutes, and why are, why are we going and spending literally millions of dollars on these things to deploy them? But, but we are. And we're, we're trying to develop in house solutions within 160, PMW 161, who is Navy's information assurance program manager. They're responsible for Navy IA. And they're trying to come up with some solutions that will satisfy 80% of the need that's out there. So when somebody says, hey, I have this operational need, they can say, yes, I have this solution. Here, go use this subset of what we've already developed to satisfy your need. This next one is just showing what the directory would look like. If you're going to do an upload, you click on the menu, you would get upload or make new directory. It's a little bit confusing here because you see the label is secret US NATO. And that's a, what's that telling me is that this screenshot was taken from the COS console itself by somebody logged in the system administrator. Because this is that top level, if you remember, where the LNAP directory was that we're doing the authentication in. So they're seeing all the compartments from this uh, higher level. But the only place you can do that is log into the COS console, and no users log into the COS console, only the system administrator. Okay. And what it is, it's a more level secure web server, and it fully integrates with the existing web environment, or it can act as a standalone server. Mm -hmm. It allows the file sharing controlled by sensitivity level and or releasability of the data. And we serves data files and web pages. It's a Extremely simple solution for plugging two networks together at two different sensitivity levels of performance. Currently, we're only going like secret US, secret NATO, or secret coalition, secret US. We're not trying to, to go, say, secret US to unclass. There's some other issues that we need to address before we do that, since we're only using a CMW, compartmented mode workstation, at the B1 level. Okay? You might want some higher assurance before you start jumping further than just secret to one secret. Okay, the sensitivity levels are configurable and they're determined by the local coalition requirements. If you have multiple countries, you don't have to have just two compartments. You could have up to eight, eight network interfaces, which is a limit of the sun operating to the hardware that we're buying now. So you can be an Ultra 10 or an E250 and you can put up to eight interfaces on one of those with two quad cards. And then just configure your compartments. And everything is audible, as I mentioned before. It's built on a V1 Plus trusted operating system. V1 Plus means the CMW. There's some additional features in the CMW that's slightly above what's required for just a straight V1. And it's PKI based. Uh, it's, this is really important because we're doing at least a token based authentication to the users now that we're at the smart card. Advisory labeling of HTML documents. When they're rendered, you saw the security labels that were on the rendering of the directories. If it happens to be an HTML page, there is a banner with the color coder that is automatically added. So like you could use one of the free websites where you can post your own web page for free, GeoCities or something like that, and they put these extra banners or tokens in there in front of you. And it's a similar concept and is adding the advisory label. I've covered the Netscape and Windows. The reason it was Netscape, again, was during the first installation, it was the only one we could get to look for the certificate on a floppy, i.e. you wouldn't play that game. The system footprint, it's the Sun Ultra 10 or E250. We need uh, some Cat5 Ethernet or fiber, depending on where we're going, and one network interface for each system high network. So it's very minimal system footprint. It's an inexpensive solution. And Expensive and close. <laughs> right now, it's looking at something less than 100K to do all the certification, buy the hardware, install it, do all the certification creation. Get it up. Okay. The user impacts. Uh, users need to know how to take care of their certificate, and they need to how to use a web browser. Pretty low end. Okay. The information manager needs to know how to take care of his certificate and he needs to understand the command releaseability policy. This is the guy who's actually downgrading files. He needs to understand what he can release and what he can't. The ISSO is a, is a new job for the command. This is the person who is responsible for the 
God's administration and the security aspects of God's maintaining the proper configuration of the box and reporting to the ISIS on that. The security requirements, the end users are no, uh, there's, there's no additional requirements. This is what kind of clearance you need to have. The administrators, if they are going to administer a box that is going to serve both U.S. secret and NATO secret, they need to be US, have a U.S. secret clearance, they need to be U.S. personnel, and they need to be read into NATO, which is not a hard thing to do, but it does prohibit you if you were connected to a secret network from having a NATO-only member of NATO, say a, a German officer or a German operator come in and manage it in a U.S. secret space. If there's, there are some other coalition sharing locations that we've proposed where NATO is interested in sharing with people not in the U.S. and they want to install a box like this. So then that U.S. requirement goes away as long as the sensitivity level doesn't embody U.S. secret data. And some of these you guys say are no, it looks like it's a no-brainer why you don't bother telling me, but when you start getting into these issues, it becomes a political um, nightmare sometimes is that NATO folks have their image of how things need to be run, and sometimes things don't always marry up completely smoothly. You say we want to use DUDPKI, the NATO folks are, aren't real happy with that, so workarounds are we use, we often use any NATO PKI that they offer, we put both roots on the cards, so if you come from the US side, we use that PKI, and NATO use that PKI. The other NATO PKI, and we're willing to to flex and move to whatever we have to do to get it installed and still comply with the still satisfy the SABI secret of low interoperability and the DSOG on the U.S. side and then the NATO accreditation bodies at NC3A on the NATO side. It's, it's essentially, okay. yeah, it's, it's not an ideal solution, but it solves the problem of, right now, it is very difficult to give a U.S. secret DOD PKI certificate to a NATO member. We have permission to do it for, well, we have permission to give a U.S. unclassed certificate to a NATO, to NATO folks for $3 from a hotel. Exactly the same certificate, exactly the same format, the rules do Okay, so you created a different tree. So we had to have two routes for that exercise. And the, only, the third option is we create uh, test certificates if it's a small enough body or group and we use, we'll cut certificates at, at NRL or at Spay War and create our own test route and then establish a separate infrastructure. But it's, it's better if we're using the UDP. Conclusion, it's a, an elegant functional design with minimum manpower impact, a full web server functionality, and your data is securely shared with coalition partners via the web interface. Web, it's, it's easy. You can use a web browser and plug in your smart card now and use, you can use this from an end user perspective. There's very little training required. We explain the basic concepts of that data flow diagram I showed you, it's like this, the second one. I, I do that in 15 minutes, so was, I had the five Navy commanders understanding what we were trying to do and they were able to just go off and kind of ignore it and use it just to transfer the data files when we needed to. So it, it was that easy to get them to run. The minimal physical impact, the board ship in a lot of space. If you're going to install it there, if we're to not, there's still not a lot of space because of how much equipment they're trying to shove into one of those, the network operation centers. Okay. And limited training requirements. The heaviest training requirement is for the web administrator. And he has to know how to use, there's web, Interface and CGI scripts for this administrative, these administrative tasks also, but it needs to be taught how to add a user, how to remove a user, etc. Uh, our schedule: we were aboard the Mount Whitney for our fleet box from a hotel, which was the end of our last fiscal year, beginning of October. Time kind of was the beginning of this fiscal year, actually, and it demonstrated the, the link between U.S. and NATO. The NATO and U.S. approved for that exercise caveat that it's not like we have a baseline accreditation where we come with installing where we want yet. We did this pilot using the HPUX version, now we're using Trusted Slayer. So we'll get our next install is either going to be at UConn or Sink and here at a BTC Wednesday morning to determine where it's actually going to go. But once I figure that out, I'm, we'll start jumping through the accreditation hoops for both the US and NATO. Okay.
get that installed like before this fiscal year is over. And uh, points of contact. If you have any other questions about this or you're considering doing thesis work in this area, um, you can you can always give me a question. If you have if you're an ED and you want to know about ED engineering duty officer and you're looking at jobs that have spent um, 45 minutes or so talking to the EDs that were here and possibly going to Charleston uh, about jobs, um, feel free to fire away. I'll answer anything I know. I won't make too much stuff up. Is there any particular questions about this? Yeah. You said that you're using uh, smart cards. What kind of smart cards are you using? Aspirus is the, the manufacturer. And it's a proprietary system for it's, it's a smart card with, there's about four or five smart card companies that manufacture ones that will work with the DD DKI system. So those are, those are what we're looking at using. The only hang up right now with smart cards is Win 2K. Right now there's an interface issue because Microsoft isn't playing, they're trying to do something proprietary here. This comes as a surprise, but it works well with NT. And that's mostly what's installed in maybe installation so far. Your very first line was that this was an 80% solution. Did you say that? Yes. Okay. Well, what about the other 20? Where is the other 20%? Uh, there's other functionality that you would want that we don't have. Uh, integrating a database with this, say trusted Oracle. So then now you can put all your content in the database and do full, full search or a keyword search about all the documents that are residing on that. It's not a big leap of faith to see that somebody would want that functionality. Uh, the ability to do data replication. Uh, we have ships out here with a 64K bandwidth and they're operating out somewhere, in, anywhere in the world in the ocean. And they're trying to pull data files off, off of, say, a coalition data server sitting in a knock. It'd be nice if we could have an, another coalition data server sitting aboard the ship that and they could communicate back and forth in replication, via replication, keep the same database or the same hierarchy in both locations so when the ship goes to pull it, they're pulling a file from the local server and the only files that have to be transferred once are the updates back and forth. So you're making the best use of the, the bandwidth that's available. And those, uh, Improving the log files. Right now, to audit the log files, which is required at least once a week, you, know, so you, you need to be able, you need to go through the operating system audit logs and analyze those, look for abnormalities, and you also need to look at the web web log files. It's, it's two different places you have to go right there. And the operating system log files on HBox weren't that easy to to sort of dive through. There were some tools that have been written to try to make it a little bit easier, but full integration. And uh, a, log, a log file analysis tool is definitely needs to be integrated with files in the future. So if you have a database underneath, you can stuff those from in there? Yes. Yeah, that, that, would, that would make that. Uh, once we add the database functionality to COGS, integrating the log file analysis is not a big leap of faith. When you're speaking of the DOD PKI, you're really saying issuing certificates that are uh, similar to the DOD certificates? No, because issuing DOD certificates is what we're doing for the U.S. people, and we have permission to issue unclassed certificates to the NATO folks to be used on COGS. So those certificates come from the two DOD routes, or you have your own route in this sort? They would, they would come from the, the DOD routes when they're cut from the certificate, um, the certificate, um, what's the word? Authentication workstation? Yeah, yeah, and the CRA is actually cutting the certificate. I forget the name of the workstation is. Uh, what's that? Uh, an LRA workstation. Yeah. But when it's when they're actually cut there, it's coming from the DoD route, the primary route. Mm -hmm. We just have to. But they also they have to pick the certificates on the URL that's sort of right. Like any other web server, you have to be able to authenticate to that, that route, and we need to be able to do the same. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that on the input. It's, if you go to infosec.navy.mil. Now that, that has the cert certificates and there's a yeah, server, we, server we have called a warlord on there mm -hmm. where you actually present your credentials to be able to log in and you can do that from home now. So if you go just to infosec.ava.mil, you have to be in a .mil domain, but I can be in a .com and find my DOD young class certificate and I present those credentials to the warlord server, yeah. I can come in from anywhere. It's a similar concept. Any other questions? Um, you're using Trusted Solaris 7 or 8? 
five once is the only credited one so far. When eight is eight is supposed to go through this summer, this is the latest rumor. And when eight is credited in by uh, it's an IT sec accreditation we have to go and say evaluation. Some has no product in the two two five one has been through the IT sec, which is the international accreditation. British. Yes. Yeah, that version. And then they have um, there are other products that NSA has done penetration testing on also and said yes, we'll accept the risk of drilling this this sunlight. When you go through the SABI process, part of it is you they do the penetration testing of your box and your system. You said you have these advisory HTML markings. Um, is that on a paragraph basis or a document, whole document basis? Do you know, or is it banner? It's on the whole document. Um, is that done with like meta tags or something in, in the HTML? It's, it's based on the sensitivity level of stored and within the trusted operating system. So if you took an unclassed document and put it into a secret compartment, it's advisory labeling would be secret. Oh. Okay, it's, it's based on the, the mandatory access controls of the operating system, not anything that's within that document itself. Oh. So if there's this reason to label and display it, basically. Right. So you had to do a modification of, you know, as you're reading that, your HTML page, you add stuff onto the and the bottom then put these advisory labels on. Right. Yeah. That's what the, there's CGI scripts that render it. Yeah. yeah. That was my GeoCities analogies. Mm. <laughs> yeah, how they put their ad banners up there so you can't listen. What about snake oil? Uh, snake oil, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, there are solutions out there and one of them that solves a lot of the operational needs, and that I, I'm not very fond of is Domino. Notice Domino. It does, it's a great job with insensitivity levels, because it'll do all the data replication and has the database functionality that, that maybe folks would need and want. And it's, now that it works from a master database within the network operation centers going out to the ships, people want to take it a step further and have it interface across sensitivity level also. So now they're using the replication features of that to move files from one sensitivity level to another, and they're depending on the labels within the database to manage that data. So they just take a snapshot of the database, turn, put it on a jazz disk, walk over here, replicate it over on the NATO cell. Then there is significant risk, I think, with doing, and there's better ways of doing it if you were to engineer it using a trusted operating system or do it one file at a time with CODs or add the database functionality into something like CODs. There, there, there are other solutions out there. We could have stood up Trusted Oracle and used a web interface for Trusted Oracle. It would work just as well. A lot of the functionality we use over there. Yes, there has been, there has been talk of it. One of the things that I found, and I, I came from a I had a fair number of years at sea. Uh, the pace that things get done at sea, it was kind of appealing to me. Somebody says, go do this, okay, it happens. <laughs> right now, I, I'm finding that in the research and development world, you say, go do this, and it may happen within two years. <laughs> so it's, it's not as fast as I would like, unless somebody is saying that I go do this is what has significant dollars associated with saying go do this. It becomes a very difficult proposition, because even NRL now is, like we are at Charleston, it's a stay of work, maybe work in capital time, so. In other words, we work by the hour. If you want me to go do some work, you have to pay me whatever we're charging, and I can say $83 an hour for my time to go do something. So, and the same thing for NRL now. You're not gonna do it unless the dollars are 